Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Big room. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Pili. I'm a project manager at Tor Project. I've been working there since September 2018, and I manage the Tor browser community and UX teams. In a previous life, I was an API solution engineer at Threescale and later Red Hat. And I was there for five years, helping hundreds of uh, customers with their API programs. And today, I'd like to talk to you about um, how you can use Tor Project to provide a military, uh, sorry, military grade communication security uh, for your API communications. So for those of you that don't know, uh, you might be wondering, what is Tor? So Tor is software that allows you to communicate anonymously. Uh, Tor stands for the Onion Router, which is the name of the original software that uh, started this whole thing. Um, Tor is also a network of decentralized servers. And uh, these servers are run by volunteers around the globe and organizations that want to provide bandwidth for the network. We are also a community of researchers, uh, privacy researchers, anonymity researchers, developers, uh, relay operators, and users. And we're also a US nonprofit. Uh, so what the US nonprofit does is it maintains the software to run the network. So I just want to take you so through some of the facets of Tor. Uh, what does it mean that we are open source software? So it's free, it's open source. Uh, the main software component is called little t Tor or core Tor. And anyone, this software is available on the internet. The source code is available on the internet. That means that anyone can go, find out, look at the source code, and try to find any bugs and vulnerabilities. And um, believe me, there are a lot of researchers that are trying to find uh, exploits on the software. Um, so this software has been in active de development since 2006. We have a dedicated team of developers. Um, and what they are doing all the time is they're improving the performance of the software, of the network, looking for vulnerabilities to fix. Um, so they use uh, best practices for development, and you can be assured that the software is robust uh, and as vulnerability-free as we know as of today. So Tor is also a network. Uh, it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, essentially. It is free to connect. Anyone can download the Tor program and connect to the network. You don't need to register. You don't need to identify yourself. Uh, currently, we have between 6,000 and 7,000 nodes. These are the servers that make up the network, and they're also known as relays. And these, as I said before, these are run by volunteers and organizations worldwide. Um, and finally, we have between 2 million and 8 million daily users. So with this graph, uh, you can see what is the current bandwidth that we have available in the network. So the top line, you might see it as green or blue, depending, uh, shows that we're currently offering 300 gigabits of uh, bandwidth per second. And the bottom line shows the actual usage of the network currently. So we are at around 50% capacity. It's around 150 gigabytes per second usage. And so with this next slide shows the size of the network. You can ignore the bottom orange line for now. Um, but the top line shows the number of com uh, computer servers that comprise the network, so the number of relays. And this uh, varies. You can see in 2004, we had a lot of servers. Uh, but between 2010 and now, the size of the network has been steadily growing. And we're at around between 6,000 and 7,000 uh, machines comprising the network at this point in time. So this might be a good moment to uh, explain how the Tor network works. Say that you're a user and you want to visit a website on the internet without anyone knowing uh, the IP address where you originated from. Um, well, you can use the Tor network to access the website. So if you're a user that wants to connect a website through the Tor network, you would uh, 
You could use the Tor browser, for example. Uh, the Tor browser would form a circuit across the Tor network comprised of three relays. Uh, the first relay knows the IP address of where you're going to. Oh, sorry, knows your IP address, so it knows who you are, but it has no idea where you're going to. Um, the second node knows that some user somewhere wants to visit another node on the network. And finally, the third node knows that some user on the internet wants to visit some site on the internet. And this connection is end-to-end -end encrypted from the moment it enters the network until the moment it leaves the network. And then, of course, from the Tor relay to the website, it just depends on whether the uh, connection is using HTTPS or not. So how does the encryption work, and what is it with all the onions? Well, uh, each, um, each request is encrypted three times inside the Tor network. And it is encrypted with the public key of each relay, each relay along the path. So when the user sends a data packet to the first node, uh, the, the first node along the circuit will peel away the first layer of encryption because it's been encrypted with this public key, and only this node can decrypt that traffic. And the, of course, this node will know the location, uh, but the destination is encrypted, so it can't look at it. So it will pass it on. It will know the next uh, chain along the path, and it will pass it on to the next node. And each subsequent node peels away one layer of encryption until it gets to the final node, which knows that it needs to send that data packet to some website out on the normal internet. Uh, finally, we are a US nonprofit. Uh, we want to defend privacy online, and we want to fight against online censorship. Um, and the role of the organization is to nurture the network, nurture the community, and develop the software to run the network. We also advocate for infrastructure to use the internet anonymously. And this is our mission. I'm not going to read it out, but this is basically what we believe, why we get out of bed in the morning to do what we do, and why we provide and maintain the software to run the network. So at this point, you may be thinking, well, this is all great, but I'm not really interested in anonymity. I mean, what does this have to do with API security? Um, well, I'm going to show you. So we have this uh, special thing in Tor called Onion Services. So before we looked at uh, the Tor traffic going from within the Tor network out to the internet, but what if the traffic was kept inside the Tor network? Uh, and that's basically what Onion Services are. These are um, services that exist entirely, that are exposed entirely within the Tor network. You can only access them using Tor. Uh, and they're essentially decentralized peer-to-peer -peer services. They're end-to-end -end encrypted, same as before. You don't need to have use HTTPS. They're secure, and um, they obscure the identity of and location of both the client and server. Now, that's a property that they have, but there's no need why this has to be true. You could share an API on an onion service with a client, and they, you both know who you are. It doesn't need to be uh, anonymous. There is very little configuration necessary to expose uh, an API as a web service, uh, sorry, as an onion service. All you need to be able to do is to connect to Tor. There's no port forwarding necessary. You don't need to open any firewalls. It just works. So. How do they actually work? I'm not going, this is, it's a little bit more complicated than the slide shows. I'm not going to go into great detail. But essentially, an Onion service will advertise itself to a directory authority. And this is basically saying to the directory authority, here I am. A client somehow learns of a location, well, learns of uh, the existence of an Onion service. And, it, uh, and the client will pick a meeting point or a rendezvous where both of these are going to meet, both the onion service and the client are going to meet to exchange data. Uh, so once again, uh, the communication, both the client and the service, 
pick a path of three nodes across the Tor network to meet at the rendezvous point. So, why are they so great for anonymity? Well, so why are they so great for APIs? They actually have a few other properties than uh, allowing anonymous communication. Onion services are self-authenticated. Uh, that means that you are guaranteed to be accessing the location that you're intending. As a client, if you have the Onion, the onion service address for a service, there is no way that uh, a malicious third party could be intercepting your traffic to that Onion service. Again, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. You don't need to use HTTPS. You don't need to pay for an SLSSL certificate. Uh, and you don't need to mess around with self-signed certificates because it's all already end-to-end -end encrypted within the network. Another interesting property is that you are decoupling the internet location of a service from its onion address. So, well, it's, it's a lot harder to find unless you actually know the location of it. You can't just discover an onion service address by itself. Someone needs to tell you of its uh, existence. The service itself can just be running on localhost. Um, it doesn't need to have any knowledge or any particular configuration to show that this is being exposed as an onion service. Uh, and then because you are only making outbound connections, um, again, you don't need to open any firewalls, you don't need to open any ports, it punches through NAT. Uh, with minimal uh, configuration. Well, no configuration, really. And since it doesn't use the DNS or regular internet routing, uh, there's no risk of DNS hijacking or BGP poisoning attacks. So I'm just going to go into some of these properties again in more detail. So why is an Onion address self-authenticated? Well, um, Onion addresses are 56 Sorry, these are not the slides I thought they were. I'm very sorry. Um, maybe well, I opened the wrong ones up because I wanted to show you an example. Oh, no, no, sorry, they are. They are, I think. Well, anyway, we'll carry on. Uh, so an onion service is 56 characters. And these 50, 56 characters are a hash of the public key of the onion service. No one else can generate this, or no one else can generate that and target the same service. Uh, that means that there's no impersonation possible. The only way someone could reach the wrong service is if they mistype the address somehow. Um, and this is all guaranteed without a centralized certificate authority. So the other property is the end-to-end -end encryption. Each request is protected by three layers of encryption. Um, so Let's face it, all internet traffic is monitored by someone somewhere. And HTTPS encrypts your payload, but a passive network of, of observer can actually uh, deduce a lot of information about your activities online just from the metadata of the connection. So um, this makes it on your services a very good uh, alternative for confidential data sharing. And again, you don't need an SSL certificate or anything else. So this is an example of um, the sort of data that people can see when you expose uh, any service using HTTPS. So this is a, a diagram from the EFF. And at the top, you can see, I mean, it's a hacker, but it could really be anyone that has access to your network. So I'm not sure if you can see properly, but at the top it says site.com and at the bottom location. So anyone sitting on your route from, uh, say you're an API provider to the API consumer can see uh, where you are, where your request is coming from, and where it's going to. With Tor, all they can see is all, you have to be at both ends throughout the, uh, well, in fact, you would have to be in the relays in order to figure out uh, both where a request is coming from and where it is going to. So I'd like to argue that uh, Onion services are the natural progression from uh, HTTPS for truly secure API traffic. And why is that? What can a passive network observer see from HTTPS? 
So if you are an API consumer, a passive network observer can see where you're getting your data from. Uh, if you're an API provider, a network observer could see where your servers are. They could also see how frequently you're sharing data, of how frequently sharing data, at what times you're sharing data also. Who your customers are, uh, if they can see both the source and the destination, they can know who your customers are. And uh, your usage patterns, so how often are you getting this data, um, all sorts of things. So uh, Tor basically protects all this metadata for free. And it's, uh, it's technology that is, um, is secure enough to withstand the threat of nation, uh, nation state great actors. So what are the use cases? Well, anywhere where you're sharing uh, sensitive data, so the healthcare sector, government services, um, if you need to enforce strict Chinese walls within your company, this could be a good solution for you. You might not want one division or even the sysadmins to know who you're communicating with, who you're sharing data with, with your APIs. Um, it can also be very good for securing vulnerable infrastructure. I spoke before about how the internet address is decoupled from the onion address. So the only way to attack a service, well, you would need to know the onion address to even begin to reach uh, this infrastructure. And it, this is a, uh, there's very good use cases for the internet of things and especially webcams, which are very easily exploited. So I want to do a little demo now. Um, hopefully it works. Uh, so I want to show you, I have a very silly API, and I want to show you how I can expose that on the Tor network very easily. Um, can you see this? Or oh, maybe, let me make it bigger. No. This is working, sorry. Okay. Uh, it's not working. No, it's not working. I'm not sure why. Can you see okay? Oh, this one is fine. Okay. So, okay, first I'm going to, I have a machine somewhere. Could be on Amazon, could be on my computer at home somewhere on the internet, and I'm going to, going to SSH into it using the Tor network. Hopefully it works, fingers crossed. Now, it's a little bit slower. The one uh, shortcoming is that you are going through three relays, so it's going to be a little bit slower than what you're used to. Uh, so latency can be a problem. And I'm relying on the Wi-Fi network here, and, uh, but I tested it earlier and it worked, so we'll see. But if you can bear with me, there we go. Just log in. So what I've done here is I'm running my SSH command. I'm running Tor Browser, and Tor Browser gives you a SOX proxy for free. So you can use the SOX proxy to connect to the Tor network. And you can connect using SSH or whichever way uh, you want to connect to the network. It's usually not this low. It's actually uh, a, lot more, a lot faster than you would expect. Oh. That doesn't help, does it? Oh, crap. Sorry. Uh, wrong password again. OK. Third time lucky. No. Demo effect. Sorry, everyone. There we go. So I'm in my machine. And what you can see here is uh, my Tor configuration. And all I've done is I've downloaded Tor on my, this is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's running Raspbian. I just downloaded the dev packages uh, from torproject.org. 
and it installed Tor. And then there's a configuration file called TorRC, which you can uh, edit to expose uh, Onion services. So I'm actually exposing two Onion services here. One of them is my API on port 5000, and the other one is my SSH connection on port 22. So one sec, I'm just trying to show you my um, maybe this is too big. Oh, I'm not sure whether that's the which screen that is. Okay. Um, well, let's just make a call request, okay, and see where it goes. Um, so, let me make this bigger. There we go. You can probably hopefully see that. So, I'm going to make a call request using my SOX proxy, uh, which is running locally on my machine, thanks to Tor Browser. And I'm targeting that very long, nice uh, Onion address. And it's a very stupid API of users running Flask. Uh, I'm not in the API industry anymore, so I, I, can't, I can only make rubbish APIs now. Um, so if I, I can just call that very easily, and it will connect, and it will return the data. So that's uh, a very simple API. And if I go back to the other thing, you can see the request. So actually, that is my. Um, my API server screen, you can see the request arrived here. And that is, that is my tour. Um, maybe if I zoom out, we can see it a little bit. No. OK. Uh, but that's the, the tour, the screen showing the tour demon running, which is not showing up. And that is basically it. Happy to answer any questions uh, about this. Thank you. Anybody has any question? Raise your hand. Yeah, come. Can you pass it down? Hello? Hi. Hello. So I, I was just wondering, uh, as we all know, you know, the Tor community is pretty much linked to the uh, you know, those folks that you know, log into the dark web and the deep web, you know? So I was wondering, isn't there a pressure from governments or state agencies against the Tor development community to actually provide APIs by which they can also reverse track, uh, you know, different activities in, inside the dark web, specifically for pretty bad cases? So, if I understand the question correctly, you're talking about the conflict between Tor and government agencies, exactly. right? Exactly. It's a very conflicted relationship. A lot of our funding actually comes from government sources. And we're very, we're very public, we're very open about this. Um, I take a little bit of issue with the terms dark web and deep web. I mean, they, they sell uh, the, the very interesting topics for the media to talk about, right? Because it's dark, it's hidden. Actually, Onion services are a very, I don't have the slide, but we have a very good slide. Onion services are a very small part of what is called the dark web, right? Dark web or deep web is essentially all unindexed uh, traffic or websites on the internet. We're talking about WhatsApp as well. WhatsApp is a dark web. That's not, a, you know, it's encrypted. It's not really indexed by anyone by Google. Um, what we want to do, we are trying, obviously, to find legitimate. There are legitimate use cases. I mean, I haven't really gone into this because I don't think it's the audience. But for fighting against censorship online, you have users in China that can't access the internet. They can use Tor to uh, circumvent the Great Firewall of China, for example. So, and I don't know. Have I answered your question? I can go into depth a bit more, but. Uh, Basically, there are plenty of, I mean, you, do you know what the biggest uh, website on the dark web is? Anyone? Facebook. Facebook has an Indian service. So users in Iran, users in China, users around the world can access Facebook using Tor. So there are plenty of legitimate use cases, but they're not as interesting as saying, hey, you know, someone is selling drugs online. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's good enough. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Good. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, how big can be the performance reduction when you are using when we are you sorry when you are using Tor? So I mean, there's um, there's this guy called Alec Maffet, and he set up the Facebook Onion service. And he has some very good tips about how actually you can run onion services at scale and how you can load balance between them. And you know, you can use this with Nginx, you can use this with any. We recommend not to use Apache because I think it has a lot of vulnerabilities. But in general, uh, there are strategies. I mean, Facebook is, is running them, so, so they know how to do it. I, I'm not the best expert to talk about this, but I can share some resources about how you would go about if you actually wanted to run on your services in a performant manner. And, and scalability of the network is one of the things that we're looking at. How can we, uh, we need to make it usable. Usability is a huge part of it. So this is an active problem that we're looking at uh, working for. And I think if, if anyone used Tor, say maybe five years ago, it has uh, sped up a lot. And you'd be surprised how much faster it is now, actually, I think. So give it a try. We've got another one here. Okay, Luke. Hi. Um, how are you guys Pick financed? Who, who <laughs> pays your wages? How are you financed? Uh, we are financed uh, by, there, there are two ways. We get donations from people like you. Uh, we get donations from Mozilla, DuckDuckGo, privacy-oriented organizations basically give us donations. We also uh, write projects. So we, we will ask for money from different government entities. To, to give us money to, um, I don't know, go teach people in uh, internet repressive regions how to access the, the internet. Um, or write uh, some software that can allow people to circumvent censorship so they can get access to Facebook <laughs> from China. Uh, so that's where we are basically funded. Uh, People like you and me, you can donate. I didn't have a donate uh, page or button or anything, but yeah, if you're interested, you can donate. Uh, every little helps. We've got the time for one more, if anybody wants to. Okay, give another round of applause for Pilar, and we're gonna move to the next one. <laughs> <laughs>